Um, well, the not the not Google, Google Plus Hangout on Human Rights of Persons uh, with Albinism, organized by the United Nations Human Rights Office and our UN colleagues and civil society partner. Uh, as, uh, as you may know, the UN Human Rights Office is launching a year-long campaign on the rights of persons with albinism. Uh, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Muna Rishmawi. I am the Chief of the Rule of Law, Equality and Non-Discrimination Branch in the Office of the High Commissioner, and I'm extremely pleased to be with you today to moderate this panel. I have uh, uh, colleagues from all over the world, actually. I have colleagues in Canada, in, uh, in New York, in Tanzania, and the UK who will be joining us. And, um, of course, a warm welcome to you all who is also uh, joining us on the social media, uh, different social media. Uh, let me ask uh, the colleagues to introduce themselves. Let me go to you first, uh, Marta, in New York. Uh, let me go to the U.S., New York. Marta? Yes, hello, how are you all? This is uh, Marta Santos Spice. I am the special representative of the Secretary General on Violence Against Children. Very happy to join you and very committed to this cause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marta. Thank you very much to be with us, uh, for being with us in this uh, hangout. And can I come to you, Aiki, now to introduce him, yourself? You are joining us from Canada today. Yes, my name is I.K. Arrow, and I work for the NGO Under the Same Sun, which is based in Canada and in Tanzania. I am the International Advocacy and Legal Officer for Under the Same Sun, and I am very happy to be here joining you from Canada. Very good. Uh, and can I come to you, Vicky, now to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Vicky Entetema. I work for Under the Same Sun Tanzania. IK is my colleague in Canada, and I'm with the executive director of this branch here. Wonderful. I am very happy to be here. Wonderful. Thank you very much for being with us. And Gary, can you introduce yourself, please? You are joining us from the UK today. That's right. So, hello, everyone. So, my name is Gary Foxcroft. Hi. I'm the Executive Director of the Witchcraft and Human Rights Information Network. We work hard to raise awareness of human rights abuses that take place due to the belief in witchcraft and other malevolent spiritual beliefs. And Under the Same Sun is one of our members, so we're very happy to be here today. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you all really very much, and thank you. Of course, for those of you who are also joining us, our audience worldwide who is watching us on this Hangout uh, uh, live on the United Nations Human Rights Google Plus page and its YouTube channel. Uh, many of you have already sent questions and shared your views. I am going to ask our panelists to address some of the issues that you actually raised uh, with today. During the Hangout, you can still tweet us uh, with questions usually using the hashtag NotGhosts. We are also live tweeting this Hangout at uh, uh, follow at UNRightsWire. So my first question is this. Albinism, as we know, is a rare genetically inherited conditions which occurs worldwide irrespective of ethnicity or gender. May I ask you, Ike, to please explain to us what is albinism? I think a lot of people don't understand what is albinism. If you can please tell us what is albinism and uh, shed some light on this uh, disease, if I say, or condition. Okay, thanks, Mona. Uh, albinism, as you said, is a rare genetic um, condition that is characterized by a low or lack of pigmentation in the skin, hair, and eyes 
um, at least in one or all of those areas. For example, I give uh, people the example of how I am actually born to two black West African parents but uh, did not inherit their pigmentation. Albinism happens not only in Africa but happens worldwide in every race and in every ethnicity. Uh, both parents have to carry the gene for the child to have albinism even if the parents don't have albinism themselves. We tend to shift away from using the word albino um, in advocacy to the phrase persons with albinism so that we can humanize the condition uh, because a lot of dehumanization has occurred over the centuries. There's three issues that uh, people with albinism face. Uh, the first one is the issue of skin. Because of the lack of pigmentation, persons with albinism are vulnerable to uh, skin cancer. And this kills most people with albinism in some regions of the world. Uh, it's the primary killer uh, of persons with albinism, in fact. Uh, the other issue that persons with albinism face is uh, vision impairment. Most persons with albinism are classified as legally blind because of uh, low vision associated with albinism. This is known as the disabling aspect of albinism. Lastly, the issue that persons with albinism face is stigma. Uh, the stigma is stemming mostly from misunderstanding and centuries of misunderstanding. And this stigma sometimes uh, can be um, manifest as bullying uh, of children across the world. And sometimes, on a very extreme, it can manifest as physical attacks and fatality. Wow. I don't think many people knew what you just men mentioned. These are incredibly important facts and very important issues for all of us to understand. As we know, and do, there is a lot of discrimination and violence and a lot of myths and profound really ignorance about this issue. And there is unfortunately this superstition that is around the question of uh, uh, the condition of people with, with albinism. I would like to talk a bit about the part of women and children in people of albinism. And if you maybe, uh, Marta and Vicky, one after another, if you can start, tell us a bit about the violence and discrimination that people with albinism uh, face taking into account what we just heard from Aiko, which is really important about how severe this condition and important for the health of these people. Marta, do you want to start first? Marta, we cannot hear you. Marta, I still can't hear you. I'll go to Vicky and then I'll come back to you. Vicky, can you... There are quite a lot of myths surrounding albinism. Yes, yes, yes there are quite a lot of myths and beliefs surrounding, surrounding uh, pe people with albinism and albinism itself as a genetic condition. So quite a lot of women are being blamed for giving birth to children with albinism. They are rejected and abandoned by their husbands who blame them for bringing shame to their household. They are told that uh, having a child with albinism is a result of a curse because of they went astray. They are also being uh, blamed for refusing to kill their babies with albinism. and. Um, they face discrimination from their families, their relatives, neighbors, and the society in general. They, most of them become single parents. Uh, women with albinism are exposed to intersecting and uh, multiple forms of discrimination and stigma. Uh, w women and also girls with albinism sometimes become victims of uh, sexual violence uh, because some people believe that uh, if you have sex with a person with albinism, a woman with albinism, then you can be cured of AIDS and HIV. And sometimes women and girls are lured into a relationship with the hope of getting married, and uh, later on uh, their partners would just collude with the witch doctors and killers 
and in uh, mutilating them and sometimes selling them. Most women with albinism are denied the rights uh, to education. That is really that is really very important, very important. Thank you so much for highlighting these incredible uh, beliefs and practices. Uh, Marta, uh, I wonder if you can come in now about the situation of children with albinism. Uh, Vicky told us about the women. I hope we can hear you now. I'll try to click. Try. Thank you. We can hear you, but not very loud. But we can hear you. Maybe if you come closer to the mic. I will be even close. Very yeah. happy to be connected. Well, the pattern that both Ike and Vicky have described has a very serious impact on children. I remember when we can't hear you clearly, Marta. We can't hear you clearly. I'll go to Greg and come back to you. We can't really hear you now. Go to Gary. Um, Gary, until Marta comes back, can you please, we heard a bit from Vicky about this superstition and this uh, uh, mystical approach to people uh, uh, with albinism. And I, I think we kind of, kind of know about practices of witchcraft that actually are, are occurring, but we don't know the magnitude of it. So if you can tell us a bit about how people with albinism are, uh, uh, are subject to these, these dehumanizing practices uh, involving witchcraft that I don't think many people in the world are even aware that is taking place. Gary, can you come in? Yeah, sure. Thank, thank you. So I, I think, um, I mean, essentially, the, the horrific abuse of the people with albinism by the technology through to these superstition police is unfortunately part of the bigger pattern of abuse that takes place across the world, and it's not just Africa, but parts of Asia and most countries around the world see vulnerable people with. Um, either with disabilities or the women, children, the elderly, some abuses of their rights due to these superstitious beliefs. In terms, in terms of the particular superstitions around people with albinism, the main belief is that um, through using their body parts. Can you hear me? Sorry, it's. Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Sorry. Um, so it's the main belief is that the, the body parts of people with albinism contain these special magical powers that can be put into potions or charms by witch doctors in order to bring greater wealth or some sort of um, power, greater power for the people who um, who go to the witch doctors. So really, you know, you know, the witch doctor here is the key in that they're both propagating. The, the belief that they can use these body parts to help people gain power or, or greater wealth, and then also commercializing their services in order to, to, to gain wealth themselves. But, you know, I mean, ultimately, a lot of the, the issues uh, sort of revolves around the fact that people with albinism have been somehow mystified, you know, and there needs to be a lot of work done to demystify the, the actual conditions that lead to albinism, you know, the rational scientific explanation for the condition. And again, that is uh, the case throughout the world, you know, there's, um, wherever there's misfortune, wherever people suffer, people need to generally find some rational, some superstitious explanation for this suffering. And it's the same with people with albinism in that, you know, they're, they're very different from other people around them and they're seen as myth mythical, mystical human beings. So in some countries, people consider them as ghosts or people believe that they might die or that they might be result in a curse on the family. But ultimately, underlining all of these abuses is the fact that these superstitious beliefs remain yeah. unchallenged and witch doctors both perpetuate the, the beliefs and gain financially from them. Thank you very much for highlighting this uh, incredible aspect 
We will come back in a minute about the role of the state in stopping these practices and the impunity about it. But I want to hear first from Marta. I hope we can hear you now, Marta, to tell us about the situation of children with albinism. That would be very good. And then I'll come back to you, Aike, to perhaps tell us about the role of the state in investigating and putting an end to these practices. Maybe Marta. Now, let me try again. I hope you can hear me better. Uh, I was saying that as a result of the stigma and the ill perception in the community about how persons, children with diabetes, with their blood and other people that they trust, very often they seem to be part of the scenario and not being noticed. And I was telling about my own experience in visiting Tanzania and meeting young people with albinism. And they were saying that they were perceived as being persons who were fading away and absolutely not taken seriously in their life. And this very strong perception in the community creates a lot of fear and pressure and legitimize, unfortunately, acts of violence against these children. We know that there is a perception that the blood of children with albinism may bring good luck and they call problems in the community. That uh, the lineage of uh, children with albinism may even help winning a local election. So, in a way, the perception is also savory, that's positive in the community that continues to aggravate the survival and the society of these children who are not only surrounded by food, surrounded by the violence that are dramatic and then we often bring them in. And, and so it, it is very dramatic that people feel also frightened to bring complaints. Authorities feel very often that, not to be the right investigation. And the community is taking it back. And it's very significant. But as we were saying or hinting, it is really important to recognize that although we have this pattern of torture and mistreatment, there are things that we can do. Let's speak a bit in my mind. The fact that there is a problem with the scheme of persons with disability may uh, simply make people understand that if children who are wrong things. Thank you, Marta. We couldn't hear you very, very well, but I really want to take this opportunity to thank you very much for all the work that you do for the United Nations for, to combat violence against children, and clearly children with albinism are a, a special category of uh, children that really need additional protection. So thank you very much for all your work in this area. I can, can I come to you to tell about the role of the state? And we see, I would say, we don't hear of a lot of cases where people, we heard of horrible practices. We heard of horrible beliefs that lead to really incredible discrimination and violence. But we don't hear a lot about prosecutions or we, which doctors, so to speak, witchcraft doctors and so on. Can you tell us what can be done and what the state need to do to combat the, these uh, incredible vi uh, violent acts that we heard about? Aike? Yes, uh, Mona, that's right. Um, the state has an incredible role uh, to play in two key areas. The state has to step in to improve impunity on the one hand, and on the other hand, the state has to step in to raise awareness. Not every country in the world has the problem of physical attacks, but every country in the world has the role to play in awareness. On the issue of impunity, there has been over 300 cases of attacks recorded across 24 countries, and only 5% of cases of physical attacks have actually reached any kind of prosecution. 5% over a period of almost seven years is quite low. So impunity needs a lot of work, and under impunity, states need to take more concrete measures in preventing the attacks from occurring in the first place. And also, the state also needs to open full and impartial investigations as soon as attacks happen. It's very critical that investigations are not just announced, but taken to their full measure, and that they're open and that they're impartial. 
state also needs to, when the cases do go to trial, to avoid uh, discrimination getting into the procedure. This is a matter of procedural fairness, and persons with albinism in the 5% of cases that have gone to court have suffered discrimination even in the court system. For example, we had a case where a person with albinism, her testimony was devalued based on the fact that albinos don't see well. And this was a problem, is a problem, because it shows that discrimination even infiltrates not just the culture, but even the institutes of the state. And the state can begin to address this. Um, lastly, on the issue of impunity and related issues, uh, the state can bring redress to victims, psychological, medical, uh, financial to help them start their lives again, especially those who have lost arms and legs. The state can step in and provide redress. So that's it for impunity. And on the other hand, the state needs to uh, work on awareness. Thankfully, there are now two UN resolutions that the state can, um, that civil society can bring to their state uh, to tell them, look, the UN has actually done its part. It has provided some concrete steps uh, for you to follow and urging you to uh, carry out your duties as the, the, one, the number one primary protector of persons with albinism. There are two resolutions that help in this regard. The first resolution was adopted last year, June 2013. And if people just Google uh, albinism resolution 23 slash 13, they'll find that this first resolution on albinism mentions some concrete steps that states ought to take in providing accountability and ending impunity. More exciting though as well and also important is the recent resolution that was adopted last month at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva that instated International Albinism Awareness Day and that's June 13. So we're very excited that this will be a platform to raise awareness um, for NGOs and also for states to end uh, the attacks and widespread stigma. I, thank you so much for highlighting these issues and thank you uh, on partic particularly highlighting what needs to be done by states to combat impunity but also to look at what the United Nations is doing, particularly this recommendation by the Human Rights Council to the General Assembly to have 13th to proclaim uh, or announce 13th of June as International Adism Awareness Day. I think this is really important and I really want to commend the civil society organizations, your organizations here, have been, which have been pushing really for this, for more awareness and for the states to take this, uh, their responsibilities and really uh, raise awareness about the matter. And I, I dare to say, without you, I don't think the Human Rights Council resolution would have been passed, would have passed. So thank you so much for the fantastic work that you have done in this level. But let me pick up on some of the issues that actually said because we actually have. To some questions that came to us uh, through the, uh, uh, Twitter and uh, the Google Plus, and I just want to group them in two areas. One, if we can, if you can, and uh, any of you just raise your hand, just say uh, any of you who would like to answer it. Uh, what are what kind of protections? I'd like to think of protecting measures that we can actually that we can do to actually protect people with albinism from violence and discrimination. So if we can focus a bit on this protection issue. And my second question, of course we are talking about when we are talking about impunity, one of the main issues normally when we talk about impunity is that we need people to come and testify. You need you need witnesses, you need victims to come forward. So, of course, these people often, the victims and witnesses, fear reprisals. So, what can be done? So, the protection of people on albinism in general and the protection of people who come forward and basically denounce these practices. Who would like to take that uh, question? Vicky, would you like to try? Yes, why not? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the state, as Ike pointed out, is supposed to protect persons with albinism. So they have to put a protection mechanism in place. Say, for example, in, uh, in Africa, it's very easy for someone 
when they go into remote villages to be known that those are not from that village they're from another place so uh, if these people can be watched like it's like, it's like neighborhood watch so that mm -hmm. people with albinism uh, can be protected one by their families but also uh, these people who are new to the area uh, they should be uh, people should inform them that they have to go to uh, to like the uh, uh, local government offices and report why they why they are there in uh, in terms of um, uh, remote rural areas in Tanzania people know one another so definitely when they know they find out that there are some suspicious people in that area they should first or face them or report them to the authorities yeah. that is one of uh, one uh, one type of you can say uh, of mechanism uh, protection mechanism that should we should be uh, sort of following Thank you, Vicky. Ma I wonder, Marta, if you have any views on this. No, thank you so much. I, I think it's very important that we also think about what can be done. I still can't hear you properly, but I think you should, we should try, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I think that we also need to try to do things before incidents of violence or ill treatment or discrimination take place. And prevention is very important. Uh, for instance, we need to have a very clear legislation that prohibits all forms of ill treatment or attacks or torture uh, of uh, persons with uh, obedience or children with obedience. And the, the community needs to know that the law is to be implemented, that it gives them a tool for them to use. They also need to have the information about where to go, who is ready to listen to their complaints and will follow up the investigation. And certainly, in this regard, we need to invest on two things. One, empowering the families. The families need to feel all the expectations the world has on their role in protecting children, caring for children, and preventing situations of treatment and discrimination. And we need to empower the children because, of course, they are the first line of prevention. But certainly, we need to engage again. I, I think it's such an important point that this is our friend. We need to involve the religious leaders, the local leaders, those who have authority at the community level who can be the ambassador of the agenda of the government. But then there are two other things. One is that in the often we don't know how many children with albinism exist in our community. You know, we don't have a system of blood registration. It's very difficult to plan this. We can't hear you properly, Marta. You cannot hear me. Sorry. I was mentioning the importance of blood registration uh, so that we know how many children with albinism exist. We are yeah. Okay. Thank you, Marta. Thank you very much. Maybe just the last words because we have to uh, end it very soon. I'll start with you, Gary. If you have just the last words to say, like literally two seconds. Okay. Thank you. So, so yeah. I mean, in terms of actions for people with albinism, ultimately, you can have prosecution of assailants. You can have various other measures put in place, but until the belief system is challenged that people with albinism are ghosts, that their body parts can be used to create wealth, until that belief system is challenged and measures are put in place to stop people believing it, then there will always be a market for people with albinism's body parts. So it's driven by market forces, often by the elites at the top, the police, social workers, judges, all of the different tiers of society will all hold these beliefs until something can be done at community level to demystify the common ailments associated with beliefs in witchcraft or with um, you know mystical beliefs in, in that people with albinism um, body parts can use. Until these beliefs are challenged, this abuse will be perpetuated. So for for us, I think lots of work needs to be done at community community level to to make people realise that these. The condition is genetic and it's not um, a ghost that, that people will see in front of them. 
Thank you very much. Aiki, just last word, please. Yes, please. Um, yes, this is a very uh, uh, pessimistic um, issue to talk about, but interestingly, at the same time, I believe it is also uh, the dawn of a new era. As a person with albinism growing up in West Africa, I never knew that I'll have this time, um, I'll witness this period where uh, the beginning of the end of discrimination, uh, of stigma, of misunderstanding, disability, and, and trauma. So this is really a new dawn for persons with albinism. We have good resolutions that we can use. Uh, we have a lot of um, tools in our, in our arsenal to use to forge a new future, um, preserve lives, and end the, the stigma. So I think there, there's hope on the horizon, even though, as Gary said, there's a lot of work to be done, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aike, for these words. And Vicky? Yes, uh, we can use the, the media in order to disseminate information about the resolutions that Aike has spoken about. Otherwise, they will just be uh, folded in uh, files and uh, the word cannot reach the, the people. So we really need to educate the, uh, the public using the media, but also educate parliamentarians because they're the people who are making the law and if they do not understand what albinism is, it's going to be a problem. And uh, they're the people, who, some of them consult which doctors. But in case, uh, when cases go to trial, quite a lot of people who are end users, these are rich, rich people, those ones are not arrested, they're not arraigned in court. So we really have to work very hard to try and um, sort of make these people face uh, the, uh, the, the, the courts. They have to be arraigned in court and tried and convicted if there is any conviction. But uh, because they are not caught, because they are very influential and they've got the money and there's quite a lot of corruption within the police and also the judiciary, it's very, very difficult to get them. Once we get these people, I think uh, we will start now seeing the end of mutilations and killings of persons with albinism. Thank you very much, Vicky. And Marta, last word on this. Marta, we lost you completely. Last word on this, Marta. Well, we lost Marta, so let, what is left is for me to thank you all. I think really what we, our discussion today has highlighted one of the most important issues of the day, discrimination and violence against people simply because of the color of their skin. Uh, we, we described to you a genetic condition that leads people leads to superstitious practices, ugly superstitious practices, crimes that are committed with impunity and really we would like you all to join hands and join us together in this year to really stand up for the rights of people with al albinism and to fight this horrible form of discrimination and violence on the basis of color. So please stay with us stay and stay help, uh, and help us in this campaign. Uh, our office, the UN Human Rights Office, you can see it on our website. We have uh, published a specific study, a specific report on uh, this issue, and please read it. And if you have any questions, please send it send to us. And stay tuned. Uh, stay tuned and keep sending us questions at hashtag not ghost. Um, we'll keep, we hope to keep this conversation going and thank you very much everybody for being with us in this hangout. Thank you in particular to our participants from the UK, Canada, New York and Tanzania. Bye bye for now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.